we're going to do a review of uh, Bulletproof uh, Salesman here. So we're going to kick to the review as we usually do and then come back and talk to John with some amazing facts you don't want to miss. Okay? So come right back after the review. Let's go and do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, now I would really like to know if he does it or not. <laughs> so he took his weapon. I was inside the car. The camera was there. And the guy opened fire on the car. We're being shot at! <laughs> Don't cry! <laughs> go by, go by. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Unfortunately, he also destroyed the outside mirror of the vehicle. But yeah, besides that, there was only cracks in the paint. Okay. So this is chip the paint. Yeah. We've seen the Iraq war from the perspective of soldiers, their families, and the civilians caught in the crossfire. But what about the salesmen? This is who Michael Tucker and Petra Epperlein turned their focus on after making Gunner Palace, one of the quintessential documentaries about the Iraq war. In their new documentary, Bulletproof Salesmen, they follow Fidelis Clover, a German who specializes in selling armored cars in some of the world's most dangerous war zones. This, of course, would make Clover a war profiteer, and Clover himself admits that peace hurts his bottom line. But as we follow him from Iraq a few months after the fall of Baghdad to Afghanistan, we see that Clover, an intelligent, professional, unapologetic businessman who believes in his product and knows what his customers need even before they do, defies such easy categorization. Clover understands that in his business, catastrophe for most means opportunity for him. So when Baghdad falls, he heads to Iraq to peddle his German-made luxury armored cars. But when he gets there, it seems like he's the only Westerner who actually understands what's going on. The border security is lax, the U.S. military presence is light, and no one seems to realize that they're sitting on a powder keg. At first, the demand for his vehicles is light, but as the IEDs start going off, the orders start flooding in, making you wonder how a salesman could have assessed the situation in Iraq so accurately while the Bush administration was completely off guard by, well, everything. At first, Clover considers Iraq to be the perfect war, where high-ranking officials, media, contractors, and businessmen will all need his cars to survive the hundreds of ambushes and explosions ravaging the country. And Clover definitely knows how to pitch his wares, from keeping his fingernails clean and dressing the part to allowing a potential customer to shoot up one of his cars with Clover inside. The film jumps back and forth between Iraq and Clover's testing ground at an undisclosed location in Bavaria, where Clover tests his vehicles against larger and larger explosives to keep up with what you might call the changing marketplace. And even when one of his clients is killed, Clover understands that the best way for him to improve his product is to study how they fail in the real world. But as the IEDs become more powerful, Clover realizes that Iraq is no longer the place for him. That's because he sells a high quality product with a price to match, but lower cost and lower quality competitors are coming in and Clover knows that his customers will usually choose the cheaper car over the safer one, especially when they're only meant to protect some lowly contractor. And when all the insurgents need to do to defeat his newest vehicle is simply up the amount of explosives, staying in Iraq simply doesn't make good business sense anymore. So Clover moves on to Afghanistan knowing that the escalating violence there means more potential customers. And if he gets tired of Afghanistan, he knows he can always turn on CNN to find where else in the world someone will be needing his products. While Clover is undoubtedly an interesting guy who gives you a unique perspective on war, sometimes it's hard not to feel like you're watching a 70-minute infomercial for Clover's armored cars, even with the on-screen text that emphasizes the dark humor in Clover's claims. Like Gunner Palace, filmmakers Tucker and Epperline allow their subjects to speak for themselves in their own words. And Clover is way too smart not to see the opportunities inherent in having a camera crew follow him around as he sells his cars. Clover is always pitching, always hustling, and always in control of his image and message, even when it seems like he's just chatting. It's hard to watch the movie without thinking that if you needed an armored car and had the money, Clover would be the guy you'd call. And I'm sure that's exactly what he wants you to think. While Bulletproof Salesman shows you the mindset of one particular salesman, it avoids some of the thornier issues around war profiteers, especially since Clover's products are technically designed to save lives. But it's important to remember that Clover is a relatively small fish in the war profiteering game. That there are huge corporations who stand to make billions from war with battlefields serving as both the proving ground and showroom for their jets, missiles, and mercenaries. And when you think of the political and lobbying power of giants like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Halliburton, and Blackwater, it's easy to imagine war profiteers who don't just want war to happen, but have the power to actually cause it. I'm Jonathan Kim, and this is a Rethink Review. All right, John. Uh... There are so many interesting things to talk about there. First, um, let's on specifically on this guy. So they, he's going to make a lot of money from this in the beginning, but uh, how much do the IEDs cost that made him by the end, and how powerful are they that, that made him moot in Iraq? 
Right. The, the number for Afghanistan, how much it costs to make an IED is $10. And I had heard that in Iraq, it's something around $30. Ooh. So, uh, you know, we're spending billions of dollars to try to defeat these IEDs, which cost almost nothing to make. But then also to make them more powerful costs nothing either, because all they have to do is just stack them up on top of each other. I think at one point they realized if they put like a, a thick metal plate underneath the explosives, then more of the explosive would be channeled upwards. And, um, and even the, the explosively formed projectiles, which are considered the most dangerous of all the, of all the IEDs, they can go through an, Abrams an M1 Abrams tank. So any of, the, uh, of our newly armored Humvees or MRAPs that we're going to put up there are not really going to do much good against them. All right. So let's get to the larger issue that you talked about at the end of the review, because that's so interesting. First, tell us what the Iron Cross is. The Iron Cross is basically Congress, the Pentagon, and defense contractors. And between them, people are sh shuttled back and forth through there. You know, so maybe someone from Congress is working with the Pentagon. So then they go to a defense contractor. Maybe someone who works for a defense contractor gets hired by the Pentagon. Or they lobby Congress. And so it's basically this revolving door amongst all three of those. And, and uh, the senior mentor program inside the Defense Department, th it's a little combination of two of those at least, right? The Pentagon and the defense contractors. How does that work? Yeah, so the Senior Mentors Program, I think it's been going on since the, the 80s, but it's, it's ramped up a lot where they take retired generals, maybe three or four star generals, and the, the Pentagon pays them as, uh, as advisors up to like, like $350 an hour. To advise, to advise them on like war games and strategies and kind of things like that. Then, so they're hired by the Pentagon as, as subcontractors. Then the defense contractors also hire these generals as subcontractors, and they pay them even more on top of what the Pentagon's already paying them. But when, so when these generals go in to discuss, to discuss strategy and things, they can take that information back to the contractors and say, hey, you know, this is going to be happening. Maybe you should be doing something with this. They can advise that way. Or the other side could be if those defense contractors are making some sort of jet or some sort of plane or something, they could, they could say, uh, well, you know, I would recommend that when you go into Iraq, you need this type of jet fighter. And you know, I know a guy who actually makes those, and I, it's the best technology. So they could basically sell that technology and say, hey, they're do making this really great thing. It's going to be totally awesome. You guys should use that. It'll be a real boon to you. Right. So the, I, I count it about four different ways that that screws us. One, we're paying a guy $350 an hour, the American taxpayer is, to represent a defense contract, okay, inside the Pentagon. Number two, uh, as you explained there, he has an incentive to s just sell them whatever the defense contractor is making and not what's actually necessarily the best product. Number three, he takes uh, inside information from us, the government, and hands it over to the defense contractors. Right. And number four, what you didn't mention yet, uh, luckily, since he doesn't technically work for either, what are his ethical guidelines? None. He is not an employee of the U.S. government, even though he's probably still getting, I mean, he's not a full-time or part-time employee, even though he's probably still getting a pension from the, um, for his military service. And he's not a full-time employee of the defense contractor because he's only been brought on as a subcontractor. So he doesn't have to disclose really anything. They don't have to disclose to the military or the public the identities of their clients. Mentors are not barred from lobbying the same offers they're advising or from advertising their military advisory role on company websites or from taking commercial advantage of insights gleaned through their government work. Oh, well, that's a huge relief. Yeah. Free market at yeah. work, baby. And, yeah. and, and of the 158 retired generals and admirals who are in the senior mentors program, 80% had financial ties to defense contractors, including 29 who were full-time executives of defense companies. <laughs> <laughs> this is our taxpayer money going to pay these guys. It's so obvious. And the idiot conservatives are like, no, we have to do that. We have to siphon away all the taxpayer money to defense contractors. Hey, oh, and okay, so, the the baggers are so upset about their tax money going to waste and having to pay taxes, yet nothing about this, obviously. Right. Now, let's talk about another side of the triangle. Uh, what percentage of defense contractors used to work in uh, the executive branch or the congressional branch? Uh, well, let's see. There was... Um, Sorry about that. Um, well, Lockheed Martin, I mean, they, they give a lot of money to, to senators and, and representatives. Uh, they gave $1.6 million in fiscal year 2005 to 2006 uh, to 45 senators and 277 representatives, but they got $26.6 billion in defense contracts in 2006. So that represents, so the $1.6 they spent was six one-thousandths of a percent. 
So that's what they got for that for uh, for all of that. Uh, I, I want to make sure that's etched into my memory because I, I like to quote <laughs> things from memory later. So t tell me the how much did the Lockheed Martin giant defense contract? How much did they spend? One point six million. That's it. One point six million. But they spread it around to two hundred and twenty seven congressmen. What forty five senators? Forty five and two hundred seventy seven representatives. Yeah. So a little over three hundred. Right, so they bought them so cheap, $1.6 million, and they buy over 300 of our congressmen and senators. And how much did they get back return on profit on that? $26.6 billion. $26.6 billion. The best thing you can do, I've said it a million times now, are you listening? Buy a U.S. politician. Okay, best way to make money. Greatest return on investment. Why do you think they spend the money? Now... Well, to answer your question from before, 60% of the companies uh, that do defense work, uh, I'm, yeah, 60% of those companies had uh, employees or board members who had served or had close ties with the executive branch or Congress. All right, so you see how this game is played? So they work in the executive branch or the congressional branch. They know the payday is coming. Or they work in the Pentagon and through the mentors program, we explain that part of it. Those, all those people in government, they know if I play ball, I'm going to retire, and they're going to pay me a lot of money, these defense contractors. And they do, as we just explained here. And then they pay a little bit for campaign contributions. And in the end, the defense contractors make, you know, Lockheed Martin alone, $26.6 billion. It's an excellent way to do business. You buy the American government, and they pay, take all our taxpayer money and shovel it over to them. And then, so John, to come back around to Iraq and, and, this, and this story, how much does all this stuff cost, the up-armored stuff, the gas, etc.? When Remember, the Iraqis are doing, spending 10 bucks or at most 30 bucks for the IEDs. Now, you get a load of how much we're spending. Okay? There's the, it, first of all, the gas, John told me before, costs $42 in Iraq per, per gallon. And if we made it Iraq to get cheap oil, boy, did we screw that up. Right? But the reality is, it's not we, the American taxpayer, that cares. Those guys, they're making money off of it. It's not like they're going in the wrong direction. It's not like, oh, it didn't turn out like we planned. It kind of worked out exactly as they planned, right? Yeah, and I think it also kind of shows that so many of these contractors, they really didn't consider our national security to be at risk in Iraq. Otherwise, they'd probably feel a little bit worse about screwing us so badly. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, probably not. But also, I mean, it, obviously, it, it's not anything that they feel bad about, charging all, all this much or, or not doing work. I mean, the, the amount of money lost in contractors is one of like the greatest boondoggles of the 21st century. And how much of that money is gone towards people doing nothing? You know, there's stories about Halliburton. Like, they, like, a truck gets a flat tire while they're on the road. They don't have the right wrench to fix the, the flat tire, so they burn the truck. Yeah. Because they'll get paid for the, they'll get, it's cost plus. They'll get paid to replace the truck and profit on top of the truck. Uh, bags of laundry, they would do at $100 a pop. And since they wanted to increase their profits, sometimes they just take out a couple of socks and call that a bag of laundry and charge $100 for it. And, John, is it right that in order to just get the armored vehicles to Iraq, it costs what? Yeah, the, for an MRAP uh, to fly them there, because they was like, this is an emergency, like we're getting blown up, we need to get them there fast. To fly one MRAP to Iraq, $135,000. Okay. Remember what bin Laden's original plan was? And he said it in a tape to everybody. He announced it. He said, look, we did this to the Soviet Union, and we want to do it to America. You attack them, and then you uh, wait for the counterattack where they lose all their money where they waste all their money, and then they run out of money, and we win. You bleed and, them, I think. <laughs> yeah, he said you bleed them of money. This isn't about killing people. This is more about bankrupting the country. And we're playing right into his hands. Well, they're saying also that like, when you have like, all this new equipment and you know, these new vehicles, you need spare parts, you need all, all this more fuel. You create longer supply lines. You put more trucks on the road to have to transport all this stuff, which just means more targets. <laughs> all right, and then finally, you know, we talked a lot about Lockheed Martin. There's just an example, and all the companies do this. But the vice president of Lockheed Martin said something really interesting that I think is very emblematic of not just what's happening in our government, but, of course, specifically the Republican Party, which has made an art of this. Yes, so Bruce Jackson, who is the vice president of Lockheed Martin, he told a reporter, Carl Grossman, quote, I, write, I wrote the Republican foreign policy platform. <laughs> they just they outright brag about it. They're like, oh, yeah, the Republican Party, they're so in our back pocket. I wrote their foreign policy platform. Yeah, see that, and that, you know what he put in there, funny enough? More war is a good idea. Huh, who would have figured that Lockheed Martin would have thought that? Well, that's what a lot, a lot of these 
defense contractors do. They pay think tanks as well. They're the ones who fund think tanks, probably more aggressive pro-war think tanks, because something that, like, the idea of preemptive war, that's great if you're a defense contractor. Like, hey, let's make a policy where you can just go to war just because you feel like it, and make that, like, our of official American policy. If anyone seems slightly threatening, you declare war on them, in which case you don't have to wait for war anymore. That's the great genius of preemptive war and the doctrine that was written in to the Republican platform by Lockheed Martin. Now you have perpetual war. And, that's, and, and by the way, have we gotten out of Iraq or Afghanistan? Have you seen that happen yet? <laughs> oh, man, this is the game that's being played on you. You've got to wisen up to this game. I and mean, that's why I talk about a political revolt. We, we have to revolt this because they're going to bleed us dry until we're done, until we don't have a cent left anymore. And then they're going to say, as Alan Greenspan is saying about financial reform, as they say about these wars, no one could have seen it coming. <laughs> All right, great review by uh, John. Everybody check out Rethink Reviews on YouTube, on Huffington Post, and RethinkReviews.net. Thanks so much again, John. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back.